Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Happy Mum, Happy Baby, the podcast. Today's guest is a personal trainer. She's a <laughs> fitness coach, a fitness guru, I would say. And she's also a nutritionalist, which I've really practiced saying that word because it's very hard to say. It's Chloe Maidley. <laughs> Hi. Hi. And I, it's had, a I very really difficult hate to burst your bubble. What? I'm being. It's nutritionist, not nutritionalist. <laughs> oh my, that's why it's so hard, because I've put another blooming thing in bob in it. Nutritionist, not nutritionalist. Well, that, you know what, that, that makes you. my life a lot better, actually. This is, why, this is why everyone loves you so much. That was brilliant. <laughs> that was brilliant. <laughs> and really, this, well, this will be the clip that's played out the night before this airs as well. And so this is how it's going to be introduced. It's, gonna, it's how it's going to be started. Good. And a really hard word to say says completely non-existent <laughs> word. <laughs> it's like, well done. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell I don't have one. All right, I don't so have a nutritionist because I've obviously been looking for a nutritionalist. Yeah, which you is... know, you, yeah, nobody needs one to be honest. It's all it's all very commonsensical, common knowledge. Dietitians, on the other hand, they're real diet doctors, and I am not one of those. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but also, I didn't say you are now a mother of a one-year-old. Yeah, my little baby girl. Oh. She's like th- she's thirteen months old. And she is the absolute joy of my life. She's she's just joyful. And yeah, I was you know, I was saying to James last night, like I really wanna have another baby because I really wanna have this experience again. Yeah. But I have this, I don't know, I have this weird thing of like, there's a part of me that's like I I don't, I don't know that I can split my love or find more love. It feels very strange. I wanted to talk to you about this because you've got, do you have three kids? Well, I've got three, all boys, three. Yeah, so I wanted and, to and ask I, you about that. I can remember when Buzz was, he must have been about 11 months old and uh, we were getting in the lift in a hotel and uh, someone got into the lift with us and she just turned around and she said to me, um, you know, you think you can't love another child in the same way, but actually when you have another, your heart just grows. So yeah. it's not like it's been split. It's just that there's even more love there, which uh, is Well, amazing. that just makes me want to do it again because I'm one of those people that, like, I just need... I, I, this sounds kind of awful, but I, I need to love someone or something. I'm that really annoying girl that always had a boyfriend and was never just, like, casually dating or, like, in a really, like, not serious relationship. Like, I was, you were I was in. in it. I was in. <laughs> I was in love. We'd been together for years. Like, my first relationship, I was 16 to 21. Like, and it was like that my whole life till I met James. And then, so then when I had my daughter, I was like, I, I, finally, I just have this funnel of, like, love. <laughs> but then everyone's like, yeah, but wait till she's a teenager. And then it's, then they they break your heart every day. And I'm like, don't say that. But all I keep hearing about all these phases that they go through is that, but then they come back. Yeah. They'll always yeah. come back. And I think, you know, if you know, if you look at you and your parents, you always come back. Doesn't matter what happens throughout the years, you always go back. So that's yeah. what I'm sort yeah. of clinging on to. Yeah. You know, because yeah. apparently I'm re- I'm going to lose the boys very soon and they're going to come back at some stage. So Yeah, and, but you know what? I would say that's completely true. My family now, I'm the youngest at 36. There's four of us kids and then my mum and dad. We are so much close. We're more close now than we've ever been, all of us, yeah. in our whole our whole lives, including our childhood. Um, obviously, we were more dependent on our parents then. But in terms of like love and bond and closeness, it's peaking now and hopefully will continue to. So I completely back that. Well, and also you've had an amazing experience, which is something that I had last year, where you've been filming a TV show with your family. And I, and I think... For, for, so for my experience, because we went back to Italy to to go to where my dad grew up, me and my siblings, uh, with my dad. And that just meant that because you're filming together, you're with each other every day in a yeah. way that you're not normally together. And it, it yeah. feels like a right, almost indulgence, because you're a bit like, when we, would we ever get this chance to uh, yeah, be together yeah. like this? No, it's really interesting. I was really pleasantly surprised when I told my mum and dad about the show. And my brother as well, because he's a he's a very brilliant agent, um, at a very brilliant agency in London. And we were all sat having lunch and I said, listen, and I told them that that um the production company and ITV wanted to do the show with me. And I was expecting all of them to be like, Oh, don't do that. Oh, that's <laughs> gonna be awful. Like absolutely t- turn that down. And they were like, 
oh my God, you've got to do it. You're going to have like a whole photo album on camera of Bodhi's first year of her life. Yeah. And, and you're, and, and you're going to, you're going to reach so many more women. And what I do is very, is, is a, I'm basically a female kind of um, health and fitness, strength and fitness, physique and health coach. Um, and I already have a huge and amazing client roster base. Um, but they were like, you'll reach so many more women and you'd be an idiot not to, and it, you should absolutely do it. So Obviously, as soon as they said that, I was like, okay, well, I, I completely value their opinion above all else. And I'm so shocked by it that I said yes. And it was actually really nice because James is, has spent the whole summer traveling to Ibiza, Monaco, Dubai, Miami, New York, like everywhere DJing. So it's actually been really nice to um, to kind of have a real reason to kind of force him to come spend some time with me as well in the week. <laughs> like, well, you got to come back. You got to film. He's like, yeah, all right, fine. Because it's really hard, like flying back and forth to different countries yeah. all week, every week. So it's kind of forced him to come back. And because you're on camera, it is, yes, it absolutely is. What you see is what you get. But sometimes they have to think of fun things for you guys to do. So we had a very, we had a few very fun experiences together as a family that I don't think we would have had, had we not been filming the show. So that was yeah. really fun. I love that. When when is it out and what's it called? So October the 9th, it's called Chloe Maidley, A Family Affair. And then it comes out every Monday thereafter. I don't know the time yet. I have no have you finished? Have you finished filming now? We finished well. Yes and no. We still have to do pickups. So there's loads of like stuff like um, for the master interviews. Because you never know what's going to make it into the edit no. and what's not. And we film like five, six days a week. Like, and it was full on. Like, it's exhausting. I've never had so much respect for reality TV people in my life. <laughs> it was really full on and it was really exhausting. And you, you never you never know when you do the interviews along the way what's going to actually make it into the show and what's not. And obviously, once the edit's done, it's like, okay, well, we need her to talk about that and we need her to yeah, clarify yeah, yeah. that. And so we're still doing all that stuff, but um, pr pretty much nearly done now, yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing your bare face on camera. All right. Thanks, babe. You've got it right now. <laughs> <laughs> Here she is. <laughs> <laughs> right, tell me about your childhood. Where did you grow up? What was it like? So I was born and raised in Manchester, which I'm so proud of. I'm a mank till I die. Um, I was born and raised in Manchester. Um, my parents are Richard Maidley and Judy Finnegan, which I, the younger generations probably have no idea who those people are. The older generations probably do. Uh, it's they bizarre started... to me that they're a whole generation <laughs> that doesn't know who, like, don't know that. I know. You know what I mean? They're also... like... They you know, are one, of, one of my clients, one of my young clients, she must be 21, said to me the other day, like, oh, I didn't know Richard Maidley was your dad. And I was like, I'm so happy. That is the best sentence I've ever heard. Um, so, <laughs> so anyway, so, um, so they, they basically started this morning, for those that don't know. And I think because they were married and they had, it, I was a newborn when they started it and Jack was um, one how old is he? Oh, 14 months. Um, and then my mum had two kids from her previous marriage, Tom and Dan, who were 10 at the time or 11. Um, and I think because it was this like real family vibe, real family show, it was the first ever magazine show um, on, on UK television. It flew and they became a huge success and they became household names. And by the time I was eight or nine, Granada and ITV mutually decided that the show had to move to London because they just couldn't get guests down to Liverpool. It was filmed on the Albert Dock yeah. in Liverpool. You know, Tom Cruise would fly into London, do press in London all day. He'd be like, do you want to go to Liverpool at five o'clock in the morning? And he'd be like, <laughs> absolutely not. I need to fly back to LA. <laughs> so, um, so they moved the whole show to London. I obviously moved too. Um, and I've been living in northwest London um, ever since. And yeah. Can you remember what it was like to move for, uh, at that age? It was, yeah, it was pretty bad. I mean, so my mum, you know, you talk about it from like my parents' perspective. My dad was fine. My dad's really adaptable. He's like a happy puppy. He just, honestly, he's like Mr. Positive, kind of like always really matter of fact, always sees the good in everything. So he was fine. And he's from Essex. So it wasn't a problem for him coming back south. My mum is like um, a through and through solid northerner. And I think she really struggled so much. So I even think she she had quite a bad spell with her mental health when we moved. And I think she felt intensely, overwhelmingly guilty for years about oh. leaving. Um, and there, there was, I mean, I, I, I won't say who, there was a certain Northern celebrity who gave her a really hard time of it, which I thought was really cruel. Um, uh, and it really stung, it really hurt her. I think my brother, um, my my brothers were absolutely livid. I mean, really, really upset. 
um, the older ones um, specifically. And I, I guess they could have, they would have been quite, they would have been late teens by that point, right? Or even yeah, early, yeah, early yeah, 20s. They were, so yeah, they were, were they're at uni. Yeah, they're at uni. Yeah. So it was weird because then their base is now London, but they were yeah. still at uni in Manchester. They wanted to stay very much in Manchester. One of them ended up staying in Manchester. Um, and so, and so, yeah, it was, it was really hard on the family. I was kind of like, oh, this is an adventure. Let's see what happens. I was really quite young. You know, nine's yeah. still quite young, especially me. I was a young child. I was very much like, I don't know, my mum and dad were like my world until I was, yeah. I would say, 13. So, um, you know, when he started to get more of a quote unquote social life. Um, and then and then I and then I came to London and everyone took the Mickey out of me because I had a northern accent <laughs> and I made no friends. And then I was like livid. Um, but but then I took up football and then I was really good at it. And then everyone liked me. So sports, guys, <laughs> it makes you so friends. I, I feel like sports and music, they're the two things that you can really gel with people over. You know, I think yeah. in your family, if you're yeah. playing sport or if you play music as well, it's a great yeah it's a great thing 100 percent, 100 percent. uh the, your mum and dad have um been on this podcast uh and have they? they were a delight honestly i i had the best time with them they were amazing you've got They're a lot to live up to yeah. um, but one thing <laughs> that your mum said actually was um uh that you can only ever be as happy as your unhappiest child and I think in oh. those those situations, I know, and it's so true. Like as my kids get older, like I see that even more so because the problems yeah. you just want to be able to fix them all the time. And actually, I, I imagine that even when you kids were younger, like that, that idea of having to move, the idea of people coming over and maybe encroaching on your family time because of what they chose to do as profession, it's a it's a hard mix of emotions to to be feeling. Yeah, I think mum always had a lot of guilt. Mum's a guilty person, you know. She's 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 an anxious person. She's a, she she's a worry bag, as as she calls it. <laughs> and I think she when she when she got her first divorce from my brother's father, I think she's always still to this day struggled with guilt. Yeah. I think when she um, when we moved, she really struggled with guilt. And I think there were times when I really messed up growing up, and because they were in the public eye, that was very public. And my mum was riddled with guilt. When I messed up, when I made mistakes, she'd call me crying, saying sorry to me, because I don't know, it's on the front page of the Daily Mail or whatever. And also, but that's because you are, you know, a young adult, you're growing yeah. up, you're learning, and other young adults would be able to go out and make those mistakes and it, no, not really go beyond their friendship group. That's yeah, it. exactly. But it, but it always made me... I, I just always, she's just the kindest soul. Her children are everything. My brother and I recently contributed to a Channel 5 documentary on um, on them, on their life. And um, they said, how do you think your parents want to be remembered? Like, individually, how do they want to be remembered? And me and my brother, like, it's like, dad wants to be remembered as a journalist, because he is. And I think a lot of people take the mick out of my dad, but they don't realise like, how informed he is, how much of a journalist by trade yep. he is. He's one of the youngest uh, newspaper editors like, of, a, of a local paper, if not the, uh, in history in the UK. My mum wants to be remembered as, probably not remembered by many, but remembered by her family as yeah. mum, because that's her. Um, and it's, yeah, it's really, really interesting. Have uh, well at a younger age. Did you ever look ahead to the future and see yourself with your own family? Because family is mm. obviously such a massive part of your life, anyway. No, I was I was so I was so kind of internally focused on my family, my mum, my dad, my brother, and yeah. I. Um, for, for ages, I was never that like fifteen year old, sixteen year old. Like, oh my god, I can't wait to get married and have a family. Like that wasn't me. I was, I, and then, and then I wanted to travel. I just wanted to travel, 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 and I did a lot. Um, and and I didn't think I wanted kids when I I found what I do now, and I start. I'm, I became very good at my job. Obviously, yeah. I've been doing it for twelve years now. I have a lot of qualifications, and I have a lot of experience, and I love it. You've and got I, a real passion, and I think I think as an outsider watching you. You know, I feel like it definitely feels like you found your place. You yeah. found your the thing that gives you the drive that like you're so passionate about it. And it's incredible to watch, you know, your podcast you. and everything that you do about it. It's incredible. Thank you. Yeah, I love it. It's it's definitely my thing. It's my my niche. It's my everything. Um, and I was and I started doing really well with it in loads of different areas. Yeah, books, podcasts, the online coaching, the face to face. And I was like, I don't care like I had James, James and I love to travel. Then he retired from rugby and we became like party people. Uh, and I was like, I just don't think I want kids. And then 
then I thought I couldn't have kids and that changed everything. And I'm so happy that it did because, you know, you hear a lot of women be like, I kind of regret having kids, you know, and, and they mm-hmm. say it very quietly. It's not public, obviously. But, you know, if you know enough mums, you've heard one or two people say, I kind of regret doing it, to be honest. I, like, I didn't think it would be like how it is. And I think that, and I don't know, and I don't want to be too presumptuous, but potentially that's people who are like, who think that having kids is going to be the best thing they've ever done. And then when it happens, they're like, oh, it's, it's great, but it's not the best thing I've ever done, which is mm-hmm. fair enough. For me... I spent a lot of my third trimester worrying that I'd made the wrong decision because I loved my life. Like, I loved my life pre Bodhi. And oh my gosh, from the second they showed her to me to this very day, I am like, hands down, without a doubt, best thing in my life, best thing that's happened to me, would do it. The second she was born, I thought, I want to do this every day. I want to do it every day. <laughs> I was just like, this is the best thing in the world. And I don't know why, but I was very surprisingly just took to it like a duck to water. Even my yeah. mum was like... I am shocked, like how I just went zoof, and fell into the role of mum, and I I love it. So, what created that shift in the first place? Like, what made you think that you couldn't have kids, and how did that kind of make you sort so, of change your mind on it? So, James and I got married uh, when I was, hang on, thirty one. Yeah, I was thirty one, and at thirty one, I'd been on the pill since I was sixteen. Um, and my gynecologist was like, "You really need to come off the pill now." come off the pill, come back in um, in a week or whatever, and we'll talk about um, with contraception, contraception methods. So I was like, okay, fine. So James and I were married. I'd come off the pill. We were married. I'd come off the pill. I just didn't really like, th- I didn't really, I didn't want kids. We definitely weren't trying to have pre- to get pregnant. We definitely hadn't had any conversations about it, but I was just like, eh, <laughs> if I get so pregnant, I'll deal with it then. you never spoken about kids at all? It was just a conversation well, where you were like, no, you know you can't get away with that when you're in the public eye. You can't do one interview where they're like, what about Kim? What about Kim? When are you going to get married? Yeah. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, no, we talked about it a lot and we'd always just said like, eh, probably not, maybe. Yeah. Eh, but also, because my parents read the papers and stuff, you don't want to say no, like, no, we don't want kids because you know your parents are going to read it and call you and be like, crying or what the hell are you mean, talking about I don't mean about that side though but I mean just between you and James yeah you yeah, two but had yeah. That chat where it was yeah like, we're, we're, we're just like meh, meh, meh probably meh. not yeah, yeah like probably not like really like our life definitely not in the next few years like no anyway so then came off the pill and, and we're married and I said like, eh, if I get pregnant I'll just deal with it then like I'll figure it out right yeah and I was like oh I'll just get to that <laughs> jump off that bridge and come to it and uh we must have been married for two years, 2020. And I just kind of like woke up in the middle of the night, like, I haven't had one pregnancy scare. I haven't like, what is going on? So one, once lockdown allowed, went to the um, gynecologist and he kind of laughed at me in a way. And he was like, you know, at this point I was 33. And he said, you're not just going to get pregnant. Like you have to, um, I was say 34. He's like, you're not just going to get pregnant. You have to try. Like, you, you have to really try. And, you know, through an ovulation period and, you know, all the all the phases of the of the menstrual cycle. And, and then, so we carried on trying, yeah, for like, yeah, I would say a good six months, still nothing was happening. Mm. And then, no, so, sorry, so I missed a big bit there. So then I, I basically went home to my husband and I was like, we need to decide, like, do we having kids or not? And like, at this point, as soon as the ch- choice was taken away from me, I was like, yeah. I want to, I want to do it. Like, I really want to do it now. And James is like, eh, all right, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really so, all right, fine. He's happy we did it now. He's like obsessed with Bodhi. But then he was like, all right, if you want to. So off we went. Nothing happened. Continually panicked. Had all my fertility tests done at that point, and I was fi- he was like, your textbook fertile. Your hormones. Your reproductive system. You're fertile. He was like, every day, but the, well, on days you're bleeding, go have sex. And we did. And two months later, I got pregnant. And now I have a little nutcase running around my house, which is just <laughs> brilliant. It's like having, you know, that get feeling you get when you see a Christmas tree. You, you put the Christmas tree up and you walk into the room like late at night after a long day at work and you see the tree and you're like, ah. And every day I just have this little kind of mini Christmas tree running around screaming and I just see her and I'm just like, ah. <laughs> I absolutely love that. I love that. And and actually, I've heard that. I've had that advice, actually. You know, the whole uh, just have lots of sex. Just thing. do it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Claudia Winkleman said it to me. When it, you know when you go and do a TV and uh, a radio interview and when while they're playing the songs, they kind of, you have a little gossip. Cla- that yeah. was Claudia's big advice. Just do have it. a lot of sex and it will happen. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And it's not, it's not the most fun thing in the world. Like, you know, there are days where I just wanted to kill James. 
because he is not the easiest husband you can find. And I would be like, I'm going to kill... We start to have sex. You just have to, like... <laughs> can find... we just park it for a second? Yeah. yeah. Just for a find, few seconds. <laughs> find a mental mental pathway around it. Fetishize arguing. I don't know. Figure it out. <laughs> can you remember finding out you were pregnant? Did you mm. have any symptoms or anything like that? Mm, yeah, I think I kind of knew. So James is in Dubai DJing. He'd, he'd already been there for, like... I think he'd already been there for a week and he was he was staying out there for another week. And I for those for that week that he'd been gone, the full week, I had had really sore breasts. They felt mm. really full and really tender. So I was like, oh my period's coming. And then I suddenly realized it just dawned on me one morning, like, hang on, I felt like this the day before James flew to Dubai. And he's been in Dubai for a full week. Like, oh my God, where's my period? And then I was like, eh, maybe I'm pregnant. So I took a pregnancy test out of my toiletry bag, but I was on my way to the gym. I had to get yeah. to the gym. So I was like, I'll have to go to the gym right now. Got in the car, went to the gym, which t- 10 minutes down my road, got out, always do a wee before a workout, top tip. <laughs> went, into the, went to the loo, was like, oh, I'll do the pregnancy test. Did it, put it back in my bag, went upstairs on the gym floor, started my workout, looked at the test and it said I was pregnant. And I was like, obviously, I find out I'm pregnant in the gym. Like, how <laughs> how cliche, how cliche is this like a child's life going to be? Um, she already has a dumbbell rattle. I mean, we're just, <laughs> just growing her up for life. Um, and then I was like, oh, I'm pregnant. And then I was like, should I leave the gym? <laughs> I was like, or should I carry on training? And I was like, I'll carry on training. So I carried on and I had like a little smile on my face the whole time. And I was like, this is fun. Oh, how am I going to tell everyone? Um, and then and then came home and waited a, f- a few hours and then called James um, and told him. And he would... He ruined it completely, you know, I, and this is what I do as well. Like, I romanticise things in my head and then they don't yeah. come to pass how I imagine them to be and then, and then I'm really angry. But he was like, I can't believe you told me while I'm in Dubai. And I was like, I can't sit on this for a week and not tell you. <laughs> like, I have to tell you in case you can't tell I say too much. <laughs> like, stop. <laughs> like, so then that happened and then telling my parents is better. Telling my parents is really good. And my mum and dad, they always sit in front of the TV and they watch the news every night and they eat dinner. And so I just, I bought a bottle of champagne and I walked in and I put it in on the table and my mum didn't even look up. Like she hadn't even like noticed that I was there. And my dad looked at the champagne and he looked at me and he looked at the champagne and I went, I'm pregnant. And he was like, oh my God. And he got up. And it gave me a massive hug. And then I just heard my mum behind me on the sofa going, excuse me, can I have a hug? (laughs) (laughs) They gave her a hug. And yeah, it was really magical. It was really wonderful. Yeah. How was your pregnancy? Uh, I loved being pregnant overall. Like overall, it was the most body confident I've been. I work in body Which is incredible as well. When you think about (laughs) what you do, like you you empower your body so often you know I've seen you talking about even exercise and stuff you don't I think there's been a massive shift over the last decade anyway of people not exercising to punish their body but exercising because they love exercising I think there has been a massive shift anyway yeah but it's interesting that pregnancy is the thing that made you feel you know that power I think when you work in health and fitness as a woman women often project onto you their own insecurities with their bodies Oh, and I, it's, I mean, it happens all the time. It's why as a coach, you can't be a hard-ass coach, like, for example, James Smith is, because women mm-hmm. will be like, oh, I hate her. Like, what a bitch. Do you know what I mean? But you have to be soft and cuddly, whereas male coaches who are like that have huge success. Um, and it's, and it, I, think, I think doing what I've done, again, for 12 years, it's because of this. Um, I work in the body because I'm fascinated in the science of the body. So obviously getting pregnant... It was amazing for me. I was like, mm. and journalists would say it to me all the time. They'd be like, are you going to really struggle when you get pregnant? And I'd be like, no. <laughs> like, I work in body training. I work in science. Like, I love yeah. it. So I, I threw myself into it. I enjoyed it a lot. I had very bad morning sickness, but it stopped in week 14. Um, so I wouldn't go as far as to say it was hyperemesis, and I certainly wasn't hospitalised, but it was debilitating. I couldn't get up at, at all. Like, there was, a, there was a period of, like, eight weeks where I just lay on the sofa every day. <sighs> Um, it was pretty bad. And then my second trimester, as everyone knows, you know, if you don't have hyperemesis or anything or high risk pregnancy, was the honeymoon period. Loved mm-hmm. it. Was like wearing my crop top and my and my baggy cargo pants, like Melanie Black from All Saints, <laughs> loving life. 
uh, walking around Soho Farm. I was like, yeah, I'm fucking pregnant. Like, loved it. <laughs> and then, and then my third trimester came, and I got, um, I got really bad iron deficiency anemia, and I just started fainting. And I, it's given me a little bit of, I guess. It, trauma in that I now have claustrophobia so it it first happened on a plane I couldn't breathe and we took off and I was heavily pregnant in an air I was like 30 not 34 weeks 32 weeks oh anyway somewhere in that region I was heavily pregnant in an aeroplane and we were in the air and James was asleep and I couldn't breathe and I was like the panic was overwhelming and I was just staring at him waiting for him to wake up and the second he opened his eyes, it was like my brain like just went, oh, it's okay. And I just went, shoof, and I, fe- I fainted. And I woke up, <laughs> lay on these seats with an oxygen mask on and all these uh, cabin crew around me and everyone was just <laughs> staring at me. And I was like, oh my God, what happened? Um, but that was really hard because then that kept happening. Um, uh, but apart from that, I did love being pregnant. And that was simply because of your iron. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't, you can't, you can't catch your breath, you can't breathe. And then I just went down and it was fine. It's always fine. Um, but yeah, it, because of, but then, because I saw, and it takes weeks for your iron levels to pick back up as well. And I was so close to labour at that point where they drop again. Yeah. Um, it was like, it was a real kind of like, it felt like I was really racing to get my iron levels back up. But then um, I did. And so actually they didn't drop for me postnatally. I stayed nice and nice and level. Oh, that's good. Yeah. But it was around the same time that your mood sort of dipped as well. Mm-hmm. Earlier. Yeah, yeah. My third trimester was really tough, actually, psychologically really tough. I think also because James is a DJ now and he's a very successful DJ now. And he start, this real success started last summer when I was pregnant in my third trimester. Bodhi was born in, in August. Started in my third trimester and everyone knows who knows anything about DJing knows the summer month is where you travel, 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 and you clean up and you make a lot of money, right? And that start, that started for the first time ever in my relationship with James when I was pregnant with my first child in my third trimester with childbirth approaching, and it panicked me. Yeah. And to be honest, it was the same this summer having a having a little baby or being left on my own every weekend. And he comes back in the week. So like typically Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, he's at home, which is great. Yeah. But the rest of the week he's off DJing. And that at the beginning, and the show documents this, like at the beginning, and I feel a bit anxious about it, but it's my reality and it's a reality yeah. show. So you got to get on with it. But the first, I would say June and July, when we were filming that whole period, was really hard for me and really hard on our relationship. And then we kind of have like a period of adaptation in July, August, and then we kind of find a nice groove and that's really nice. But it was tough, yeah. And my third trimester was when it really hit and it was, yeah, it put the cat amongst the pigeons a bit in my head. Well, especially if you've always been able to travel together or to be part of things together, all of a sudden there is that, oh, hold on, our responsibilities are changing, you Mm -hmm. know, and actually you're not just going to be able to go off and yeah. do that the whole time, you know. Um, yeah. I can, I can definitely relate to that. You're the first person, actually, who's ever said that in response, but you you suddenly realise that your responsibilities change and now yours is with the child and the person who you always had these adventures with is now doing it on his own. It is really overwhelming, Sarah, and you're the only person who's ever put it in that through that lens, and I think that's a huge part, part of it. Yeah. And I think for any couple, you know, uh, largely mums would be staying yeah. at home, you know. And yeah. after, I think when, even in a, a, like a traditional setup, I think after a paternity leave ends and that person goes back to doing their mm-hmm. nine to five, say, and they're not mm. there from seven o'clock in the morning till seven o'clock at night, you know, mm-hmm. that's all of a sudden a very, that's a massive shift. That person's yeah. going out, they're speaking to adults, they're living a lovely life where they get to yeah. have a, a hot cup of tea or a, maybe a cocktail in James's case. Yeah. You know, and there does feel like it's a <laughs> very big, like there's a massive difference between what's what both of you between are living life. through. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. It's, it's applicable to so many, like you say, mostly women, not all, but mostly mm. women. It's applicable to so many women who become new mothers. And I think... Definitely a big hurdle. People say it's really hard in the first year and, you know, it's really hard on a marriage. And da-da. And you're right, it's because typically it, the wife, the, the li- sorry, the life of the mother changes 100%. Your whole life changes. Yeah. And the life of the father changes at most 50%. But they retain yeah. that life that the woman loses. And it is very hard. I mean, I wasn't resentful. I preferred my new life. I do prefer my new life to his 
But it's hard when I'm no longer having those experiences with him. Do you know what yeah. I mean? But so it's, Tom, it's been interesting. How did you feel heading towards the birth? Did you have any, like, grand plans of what you actually wanted? Oh, come on, we all... Those who don't have an I elected know, C-section... I but it's the question! <laughs> I was going to be right. I guarantee you, right, those people who don't have an elective C-section all want the same bath. They want water bath with gas and air, if, if and only... Um, absolutely no epidural and they literally just want to like breathe the baby out and I feel like I know one person in my whole life who that happened for which is my sister-in-law that's literally what happened she kit, she went into labor got in the pool like paddled around for a bit got out of the pool squatted down and her baby just fell out of her <laughs> and I'm like what I don't know anyone else that's ever happened to although you can tell me your birth stories in a minute I obviously was a week overdue absolutely refused to be induced which in hindsight and now I know the statistics was absolutely stupid of me um but I was on day six and they were like we're going to induce you tomorrow day seven if you're still overdue um I was like oh uh and then my waters broke in the night and I was like oh my god I knew it I knew it I knew I just had to be patient um, and I also just love the fact that I know what it feels like to have your waters break because I was really, I know for so many women it doesn't happen and I was so excited about it. Um, uh, but I was waiting for like a Niagara Falls kind of gush. <laughs> no. And no. now I spend the whole time going, is it? Is that, is that? <laughs> but you know, like it doesn't stop until after you give birth, like, it, I, which I didn't realise. So I was like, oh, there we go, that's it. And then I was like, five hours later, like, why am I still leaking? Like, Dripping so, everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I loved it. And then I loved the experience. I was really excited about having a natural childbirth, by the way. I wasn't, I was a bit scared of it, obviously. But I was excited because, again, I work in the body and I wanted the experience. I just wanted mm -hmm. to, and I'm an experienced girl. Anything I haven't done before, I'm like, I want to know what that's like. Um, so, I, I mean, I got my, my water breaking, but that's pretty much all I got, real natural childbirth. Uh, got into, uh, 24 hours later, no contractions, nothing. So they had to induce me. They gave me the hormonal drip. And because of the nature of the hormonal drip, the contractions, basically you don't get a break between the contractions. So it's basically a very stupid idea not to have the epidural. So uh, had the induction, had the epidural. And I just kept being like, as long as it doesn't result in a C-section, it's fine. Well, then what but happened? Why do you think that was in your head about not having a C-section? I I think a few things. I didn't want to have major abdominal surgery, period. Yep. And I think also you are very subtly encouraged, you know, by your um, hypnobirth hertha, if you, if you went to see a hypnobirther, but even your antenatal person and everyone I know says the same thing even if it's very subtle and they're like look if you need a c-section you need a c-section it's still really heavily laced with don't let anyone push you into doing anything that you don't want and I didn't want a c-section because I didn't want heavy heavy abdominal surgery yeah. especially with what I do for a living you know not I think people hear that and they hear aesthetics I mean phys physically it's it's changes your whole core but then mm -hmm. so it's pregnancy so it's kind of too late for that anyway but anyway so obviously no the baby wasn't coming and then my obstetrician told me that she was going to have to go in and give me an emergency C-section, category two. She said she wanted to get her out in 20 minutes. So it had to be now. So I was like, okay, that's quite serious. Um, and I cried the whole way through the operation. I was livid. I, I'm very lucky that I lived my trauma then and there in the moment. I was livid. And then she opened me up and she said, okay, the reason she wasn't coming out vaginally is because she was completely tangled up in the umbilical cord and it was never going to happen. And her heart rate kept dropping. Yeah. And that had a lot to do with it as well. And the induction, it was an amalgamation of things. And as soon as she explained the why to me, I was thrilled that my baby was out and she was safe. And then she picked her up and she showed her to me. I've got the photo and she showed her to me. And I just saw this big, beautiful baby. <laughs> and I was like, she's mine and I get to take her home and I can't believe people only ever do this once. And those are all the thoughts <laughs> that went through my head. That was it. <laughs> can you remember holding it for the first time? I can and I didn't like it because I didn't know this before and I didn't know it till it was happening. When you have a C-section, I'm not entirely sure why. Uh, maybe it's to keep blood going to the head. I don't know. You're at like a slight decline. And so you're like this. So I was kind of like this. And it's not it's not pleasant. Like, you yeah. get a bit of a headache and it's pretty uncomfortable. And I had the baby on me and I couldn't really... So I was just like, I don't want this to be my first moment with her. I was like, James, take her. So James had her for the first, I would say, 20 minutes of her life. She had skin on skin. or No, 45 minutes, I say, skin on skin. Sh Shazia, my obstetrician, stitched me up. 
as soon as I got back into the hospital bed, they gave her to me and then I just had her. And it actually, I was really happy in the end that I had a C-section because I stayed in the hospital for two days. The midwives taught me everything I needed to know. I had all the help I needed. And I, yeah, it was great in the end. How did it feel for you, um, you know, after Bodhi arrived, uh, even being in hospital, because you hadn't in your head planned to have that C-section, so you wouldn't have had anything with you in terms of like making life easier for yourself and any of that, or prep mentally for, yeah. for you know not being able to move around and things. So the only thing that I, because I took my hospital bag in anyway, as soon as I knew I was being induced, and I knew yeah. that they didn't know how long it would take, I took my hospital bag. The only thing I didn't have with me was like, you know, you get your um, postnatal pants. Yeah. And they, you have specific C-section ones that are high-waisted, obviously, which I yeah. feel like all women would rather have at that point anyway because you still have your belly, but anyway. <laughs> um, and mine were, like, not for us. They were for natural birth. And so all my pants, like, digging on my scar and you have to have yeah. the pad. And that was the only thing that was, like, actually practically and also when you're in pain, quite emotionally, like, yeah, hard. But I really, I know it sounds awful and not all women have this experience, but I'm also a big believer, like, in today's day and age, I think women are praised a lot for sharing their bad experiences, so much so that nobody wants to share their good experiences because they're scared that people are like, well, it's not like that for everyone. And it's like, well, I know, but that's my experience. Yeah. I'm not going to lie to you. Like, it was a massive, massive wave of love that just, I wouldn't even say wave, it was just like a bubble. It just went shh. And I was on cloud nine. I just was on cloud... And I, I've i never felt anything like it. There was a horrible moment in the night where I got up to go to the toilet and I just couldn't walk. It was so painful. Like, it was so painful. Um, and like I say, the C-section scar. But in terms of, like, post-birth trauma, I didn't have any. I just... I didn't. Um, so, yeah, I was, I was lucky, but that was my experience. Do you think a large part of that is simply the fact that your doctor explained why... You needed that emergency. Absolutely. I, I think the why in, in my industry with what I do for a living is the biggest, the most overlooked, and again, especially on social media, but and you know, in, in terms of childbirth as well. But why is it's like a it's like a homing beacon of reason in your head. And so if you have that. Like, like a magnet right there, all of your thoughts and feelings and emotions can just kind of come together and sit together in this one cohesive understanding of the situation. And as, I completely agree with you. As soon as she said to me, she was never going to come out vaginally. She's completely tangled up in the umbilical cord. Like, she was all over her, like all around her torso. Um, I was like, oh, okay, it's fine then. Because otherwise, the alternative would have been what? Her heart would have stopped beating and, and and I would have lost my baby. And I was like, okay, fine. And I think you're completely right. The women I know who do have post-birth trauma either weren't explained to on the way or weren't explained to after. And that creates this kind of void in your head of there's no reason why this happened to me and I can't get to grips with it. Um, so I do think that's really important. Yeah. How did it feel leaving the hospital? Oh, stressful. It because... sounds like you had such a nice time there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wanted to say stressful because the paparazzi for a no! day thought, thought I was like Kim Kardashian. I was like, do you think I'm Kim Kardashian? Like, why are you here? Like, this, like, come on now. Like, we're kind of moderately in the public eye. Like, we are not that famous to have paparazzi. So, so that was really, really stressful because she just gave birth. Like, I don't know how Kate Middleton yeah. did it. Like, who no. wants to go stand outside and be photographed after they've given birth? It was really stressful. So that was, yeah, it was, it was really annoying. And it was a heat wave. And all I had on me was, like, baggy baggy pants and <laughs> tube socks. And um, and so that was very hot and sweaty and stressful trying to get out the door into the car. But um, coming home with Bodhi was wonderful because we were living with my parents at the time. And um, I was terrified that I was just going to absolutely... It was going to be way too stressful. But I loved it. It was it was such a touch. Um, it was the best way to start the first four months of her life. Well, and also because 
Well, so my sister actually stayed with us for the first four months of her daughter's life, I love which that. I absolutely love. But with you being with your mum and dad, it's that you're their baby to I look know. after as well. And there's so I there's I saw an amazing video actually on Instagram the other day. Um, where it's a it's a woman in bed after giving birth and there's loads of people passing around the newborn and kissing the new, newborn and the uh, caption the writing that goes on top of it is something like everyone's come to see the baby but he's come to see his and she just pans to her dad who's next to her and just holding her hand while Aww. everyone else passes over the baby and I'm just like oh my god, <laughs> Dad, that makes me want to cry. I'm very emotional today. <laughs> oh, yours is so true. I think you know what actually. Someone said something to me and it proved to be extremely true in the in the weeks after having a baby. Take the mum food. Take her yeah. food. I don't care if even if she's like, no, now it's time to get my pre-baby body back. Fuck it. Take a donuts. Just take, because mm-hmm. you cannot, the last thing you can even think to do is get up, get food, go to the shop, cook food. Like, absolutely not. So I would say do that. They You get enough, you know, baby baby grow bouquets I mean I got like seven (laughs) (laughs) and it was a heat wave she couldn't wear anything but a nappy and I was like I don't know what to do with all of these I need some food (laughs) oh Oh, gosh but you were with your mum and dad for four months that's a lovely chunk of time so by the time you actually moved out you kind of know what you, you you know what you're doing yeah, I think the biggest benefit, everyone's like, oh, that's really nice, you had help. I was like, oh, really? She's a newborn. Like, it's nice to have be like, can you watch the baby? But with a newborn, yeah. you can kind of just take them into the bathroom in their docker toll, what used to be called a sleepy yeah. head, and have a shower and watch them. Like, I actually found the newborn phase really easy. Yeah, it was really. that like, yeah, that middle ground I found hard, like right when they're kind of ready to sleep in their own room and kind of ready to be weaned, but they're just not really quite there yet, like month four and five. Yeah. Those are my really, really hard months where I kind of lost the plot a bit. Um, but uh, what was I saying? But no, the, the great thing about having mum and dad was for my mental health, every day, every single day, 10 times a day, if not 100 times, my mum would be like, oh my God, you're so good at this. You're such a natural <sighs> look at you. And when somebody is giving you affirmations like that all day, every day, with something you've never done before and is very alien to you, you believe it. Like, you just yeah. start believing it. Like, if you tell yourself you're ugly every day, you, you've you got a very small amount of time before you really believe that about yourself. Yeah. To hear someone tell you that you're you're doing an amazing job and you're such a natural, it just, yeah, it, it really, I think it's part of the reason why I had such a lovely postnatal experience with my baby. And I didn't really have any any kind of big meltdowns or freakouts or anything. Like I said, month four and five were very hard for me. I was very sleep deprived and and absolutely kind of <laughs> ready for a break, um, <laughs> which obviously you don't get. Um, but I I just I had a I had a wonderful newborn um, experience, um, and I really I hope I get to do it all again. I don't know. I'm thirty six now, so I'm like, I hope. Well, so thirty six. I, I I think I think you're fine to have more babies. I know people well, that are far older. Who's your youngest? What's his name? Uh, Max. He is five. Five. Uh, so how old am I? I am 38. So I had him at 33. But Emma Willis had her youngest at 40. That's true. I did know that as well. And I, my mum had me at 40. So I'm yeah. hoping. But I just, I'm not ready to do it yet. So I'm like, oh, God, I better get it get going if I want another one. And then I'm like, no, I don't want to have another well, one yet. That's the thing, isn't it? Because you like the whole once you get to certain points. I yeah. remember Buzz being six months old and me being like, oh, oh, my God. Like, people would have had babies at this like, we know people who had this age gap, you know, and yep. you're just like, whoa, yep. you have Irish to go twins. now. Yeah, yes. Irish twins. My um, One of my best friends has a, a little boy. The week that he turned one, she had her twins. Yeah. So she had three <laughs> under, basically under one. <laughs> like, God. Horrific. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I mean, you know. These things happen. <laughs> Oops, now Oopsie. we have three. Going from one to three is like... That's, quite that's quite a jump. That's quite a jump within a year. Within a uh, year, going from one to three. No, 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 no. Bonkers. No, no. Um, you did breastfeed, didn't you? Mm-hmm. How, what was your journey like with that? Again, something which I I'm, don't love to talk about because I think people get really upset about it. I was completely ready and willing to accept that my breastfeeding journey was going to start and end very quickly because for everybody but one of my friends, that's what happened. They just found it really hard, really painful. Not enough milk came in. 
I was extremely lucky. My On day three, my milk came in. And I was a combi fed Bodhi from the beginning. I always gave her bottle or formula in the evenings and at night and then fed in the mornings and throughout the day. Um, And my milk came in on day three. A lot of milk came in, especially in my right boob. Like this one was, this one was packing like, I don't even know how much, a lot. And this one was packing like 90 milliliters if I was lucky, but this one was enough. This one would be enough to even feed her milk now, but I stopped, obviously. Um, and I loved it. I've, I found it really easy. I had no issues getting my boob out in public and feeding her. Didn't, obviously anyone who follows me on Instagram would be like, shock. <laughs> <laughs> um, so don't care just absolutely not I'm not remotely like insecure or like squeamish or weird about the body I see the body as like like I say science fascinating yeah. so I posted a photo the other day and everyone was like why why do you need to post this and I was like I don't care that you're offended by skin like it's not my problem anyway yeah. back to my back to my breastfeeding thing so I would just get my boob out all over the place like fed her loved it and then at six months she um she started to get teeth and I was like, no, absolutely. On a plane, <laughs> on a plane on the way back from Miami. And she bit my nipple. She just went, hum. And I was like, oh. And I was like, that's it. No more. And I just stopped immediately. <laughs> immediately. Immediately. I was like, nope, not doing this again. And I thought, I thought it was going to be like a whole thing where I'd have to do loads of pumping and like loads yeah. of massaging. It wasn't. I kind of pumped them you know, as little as I, you know, when I only absolutely had to just to get some relief and then tried not to the rest of the time. Really, it was only really bad in the morning. In the morning, I'd wake up in the pain and there'd be milk everywhere. But apart from that, I just, I just kind of really, it's quite common sense, I think, just really easily kind of just came away from it. And, um, she still though this morning she latched onto my boob. I was I walk around my house naked. (laughs) Yeah. I walk and she's got loads of teeth now. And I walk around my house naked and I was um, doing something on the countertop and it just plonked her down in front of me and she just went home oh. and I was like no I was like, absolutely not get off me it's so funny though but she's still got the memory of that's that's what we used to do with those oh if she if she sees my nipple she's like this it literally like runs into me and I'm like no 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 actually because she's got so she's still teething really badly now and I'm just like this is not this is not going to be fun for me oh that was always my big thing is my initial plan was to go to six months or until they had teeth and then it took so long for us actually to get into a rhythm with it and uh, buzz and buddy never bit me but the third he used to have a little i used to be like ah 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 <laughs> the horrible pain it's, it's yeah it's, I mean, it's also like the fear the anticipation of it like it's not fun you're like they're no. completely tensed up like oh my god it goes from being really nice and sweet to yeah awful but i'm really lucky i i would say i'm one of now three people i know and like all my friends have kids now um and i reckon i'm one of three who had successive breastfeeding so i just want to say that if you don't that's absolutely fine and like i say Bodhi had a bottle as well from the beginning and i would have been fine i'm happy i had the experience but i wouldn't i wouldn't have been heartbroken if i had to stop breastfeeding I don't no. think. I mean, I don't know. People probably listening are like, well, easy for you to say you never had to. And that's a completely fair argument. But I I wasn't, I was never, I was always happy to give her a bottle in, in a way happier because I knew that she'd get fuller quicker and yeah. sleep better. I, I think it's such, a, it's such a shame that so many of us now feel like we have to caveat everything that we say. Oh, I know. To make sure I th- that we're being inclusive and to making sure that people don't worry about. And actually, mm. I, I do feel like that's one thing about this podcast is that we kind of want to go, look, whatever works for you, great mm. you know what I mean mm. but let's just share our experiences and do that freely without feeling like we're gonna offend someone offend everyone I imagine that because of what you do and you would have helped so many women postnatally before in your work were you quite fascinated and excited to be starting your own postpartum journey yeah definitely I as soon as I got pregnant I started my pre and postnatal qualifications because I was really excited that something that I was really actively going through I could go through with my clients and coach them at the same time I felt like I would be a step ahead of my game and then I would also be able to help my clients and it was I was really excited I was nervous about the c-section because that's eight layers of tissue and that takes you know up to a year for every single layer to fully heal um and I I was nervous that I had this new element of it um you know everyone talks about like the c-section pouch and the c-section overhang so I was just really proactive about it I started seeing a woman's health physio in my third trimester and then two weeks post 
postnatally, I went in and started having scar treatment done, which got progressively more and more kind of aggressive, I would say, um, to stop that from happening. And that was wonderful. Um, and I was just really on top of getting my physio um, nailed, my pelvic floor, um, my core strengthening back. And I couldn't even engage my core um, for like weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks having Bodhi and doing what I do for a living. That was quite terrifying. I couldn't do this automatic thing, this central nervous system thing that I'd always been able to do was so out of reach and I would cry because it was so frustrating and strange that all of a sudden I couldn't do this thing anymore. Um, and I and I finally worked my my butt off and I would say, how, how far of postnatally... I reckon I was 16 weeks postnatal until my physio told me that I could lift weights again. Um, proper weights, not baby weights. And um, it was the best. And and then I would say the next four months was very much like, OK, I'm going to how am I going to get to the gym? Because with a baby, that's like not, <laughs> not easy. How am I going to get to the gym? How, you know, and then from there, it was like, OK, when when that ball was rolling, because motivation breeds motivation. And people were always like, how do I get motivated to go to the gym? It's like, you start going and then the ball is rolling. Um, and then it, from there, I was like, okay, now I, I feel like I can I can sort my diet out. Whereas before I was like, fuck that. Like, I just had a baby. Like, I do not care about my diet right now. Um, and then I started to sort my diet out. And then I would say eight or nine months postpartum, I was amazed actually at how my body had, had gone back to where it was. But that's because I don't, and again, I don't want people listening to be like, well, it's because I put in the work in terms of the knowledge of what was happening to my body and what I needed to do after. And I put in the work in terms of my physio and I put in the work in terms of progressively grading my training. And then I put in the work, re my dietary intake again. And um, I think I wanted to prove to myself that I could could get back to kind of a physique look, which is my look. Um, and now I've actually kind of, I don't, I don't look like that at the moment, I'm not particularly lean. Um, I'm sitting about four kgs heavier than that but I think I just needed to prove to myself that I could still do it I love that and has it informed your work with your clients in terms of you know having had that experience now yourself as well it's got to have an impact oh yeah I mean I would say more often than not women are chomping at the bit like they've I mean they've had a baby two weeks ago and they're like hey I'm ready to get on the exercise bike and I'm like no you are not ready to get on the exercise bike like oh, I went for a great run today. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you should not. Or like I had one of my um, postnatal clients recently say to me that she wants to book a photo shoot. And she's like four weeks postnatal. I was like, and she's a real physique client. And I was like, no, it is way too soon mentally, like not, re- not even physically, mentally to even put a goal like that on yourself. You just had a baby. This is a big transition in your head. You're so, you know, you're so tired and kind of spun out that you can't, you can't even figure out what your priorities list is that day. Like you can't even put it together. So putting that big, big goal like that on yourself that early on is just a big mistake. So yeah, it's definitely really helped me. And then in terms of physicality, yeah, teaching, teaching clients how to engage their pelvic floor, how to engage their core, even if they're nowhere near postnatal or, or antenatal every woman should be doing it. Um, So it has been hugely helpful. I think it goes back to what we were saying before about how much your life changes as well. You know, so many of us just want to go back to what we were doing before, you know, back back to let's find me, let's find me. Uh, And I know friends sort of who have that mentality with work as well and and take on it before getting there, kind of go, nope, that's fine. Four weeks later, I'm going to be back doing a show. Are you though? are you but you can't say that and actually I think it's only once people are there and in that place that maybe they'll view it a little bit differently because also we don't know what your recovery is going to be like until you're there you know you don't know how you're going to feel emotionally until you're there so uh yeah it's really it's a it's a it's a it's a difficult place to be I would say yeah it is and I learned you know firsthand I, I did an interview about this and the press made it out to be this like ridiculous story that it wasn't. But, you know, I'm very financial, financially independent and I'm also very prideful, I think, in, in that sense, probably because of being my parents' daughter and the judgment that's gone along with that. I want to make my own money and I want to stand on my own two feet and that includes in my marriage. So eight weeks postnatally, I was like, well, I haven't made any money in, I mean, when did I finish work? I haven't, I, I haven't made any money in like 12, 16 weeks what am I doing? Like, oh my God, what am I doing? There's no excuse for this. And I went back to work and, oh, 
in hindsight, how stupid that was. And that was eight weeks postnatally. And I'm like, and the thing is, I was lucky enough, I am lucky enough in that I could have just been like, no, I'm going to lean on my husband for a period of time and that's okay. And that was an option. And I wish I'd taken it. And, and I think it is that pride, whether it's pride in your body, pride in your work, pride in, I don't know, your sense of self. You do lose, like you do still have it postnatally, but you do actually lose the ability to pull it off. <laughs> like you once did and it's um it's actually yeah jumping the gun can actually be really I think damaging psychologically I totally agree and actually I saw that when I was doing my deep dive research uh, I saw that but then I also saw your response to it and I felt it was so sad actually that you were you were actually raising a really important issue that so many women face but that it had been turned into something completely different that then James got a load of abuse over yeah and I I, I mean it was just but this is what happens when you do pre like print press, which I'm doing obviously at the moment for the show. You can't, everything you say, they make you sound like a psycho, like a weirdo. And I hate it because they just make me look mental. I am slightly mental, but at least when we're doing it like in a podcast or on TV, you have all this context. It kind of makes sense. Like, even if like, you know, you don't like someone, at least you can kind of understand what they're saying. Whereas, like, in, in print media, it's just awful. And I read that back and I was like, here we go. And both James and I just got flooded with messages. And I was like, oh, for God's sake, it's just so annoying. I agree. Uh, so, if uh, you could write a letter on motherhood, who would it be to and what would you say? If I could write a letter on motherhood, who would it be to and what would it say? It would be to Bodhi, obviously. Because, um, you know, once you have a baby, you just go into this very strange, morbid, what if I die <laughs> mindset. Maybe that's just me. But I think about my immortality every day now. And I just want her to know how much I love her and how much she's changed my life. And I would also like to leave with the letter a mixtape of all the songs that I listen to that make me think of her, which are all over my Instagram page. My Instagram page is just basically a mixtape dedication to Bodhi. <laughs> I absolutely love this. It's like every single thing that you post of her, there is a new song. It's a new song. <laughs> so we finished the podcast with you completing three sentences. The first one is being a mum means. Being a mum means everything to me, L literally. I mean, I know that sounds like a really cliche sen sentence, but it is everything to me. It's my number one priority in life and the best thing I've ever done. And will be the last thing I think about when I when I die. <laughs> there you go, it's that mortality again. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't expecting that at all. <laughs> mortality is definitely something that's really... Like, have you always thought about it or is it literally since becoming a mum? No, since becoming a mum. I think about it all the time, like, what if I die? Like, do you know what, I don't think it helped that my best friend said to me <laughs> a few weeks after she was born... And don't worry about dying when she's this age, because when she's this age, she won't remember you. I was like, what a weird and awful thing to say to me. But I realised in the context of her life, she's got two seven-year-olds. And I think what she meant was now I'm terrified that if something mm. happened to the dad and I, they'd be aware of it. But you're really lucky because your newborn won't remember you. <laughs> it was so weird and left a field. It just like, planted a seed in my head and it never went away. <laughs> Gotta love it when that little seed goes in. It just starts planting a little tree. The next sentence is, since having a child, I. Since having a child, I have a whole new perspective on life. It's exactly what you said before. It's You can't imagine what it's going to be like when you're pregnant or before it's happened to you. Because you ha you have no, you can't articulate it. You have no idea until it's happened. Your whole perspective and your kind of kaleidoscope view of life just completely shifts and changes. And that is like, mm -hmm. actually, if you look through a kaleidoscope and then you change it to change the patterns and the colours, that's what's happening. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's, I suppose it's a different experience for everyone. But for me personally, it's been... Love is the only word for it. It's just love. It's just love in in in, in an experience, and it's it's mind blowing. And then finally, I'm happy when I'm happy when I walk into Bodie's room in the morning, 
And she looks up at me and she grins with all her stupid teeth and her stupid hair, with her blonde, spiky hair sticking up everywhere. And she goes, ah! <laughs> and that is my happiest moment of the day, from dawn to dusk. Chloe, can I just say, for someone who didn't even know if motherhood was for them, you light up. Like I feel like motherhood has turned you into the Christmas tree that you were talking about. Like, you literally, and I know mums light up when they talk about their kids, but I don't think, of all the years I've been doing this, I don't think I've ever seen someone light up so much when they talk about their child and they talk about their role. So thank you so much. Thank you. What a, what a compliment. Thank you so much. That means the world to me. You can go to bed tonight going, do you call me a Christmas tree? <laughs> I'm a Christmas tree, bitch. <laughs> I loved it. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so, so much. It was a pure delight. Thank you.